So what I was saying to the class here is that the test solutions are on the Canvas site. Your, your submission is on the Canvas site uh, graded, and your grades are in the grade book, and there's a video of me going through the solutions. That's all there. I didn't plan to go through anything aside from this uh, One thing that that few people got right, a, a minority got right, was how to handle hydrostatic forces on the curved surfaces. Remember, there's a, a possibility that you could do a, a horizontal or a vertical. And the method is that for when it's a horizontal component of a hydrostatic force on the curved surface, you want to project So that's step one. You project this curved surface onto a vertical plane. this correctly. So once, and I'll just quickly show you that for the problem, the test problem. Remember for the vertical component while we're talking about it, it's the surface it was a quarter of a cylinder, you would project that onto a vertical plane. In this case, it was um, a two-foot radius, another, I think it was feet, maybe it was meters, doesn't matter. And then you, I think it was meters actually, you, you find the depth to the centroid of that projected plane to get the So what do you mean by, I guess, projection? So do you mean like, for example, if you were to look at it like straight forward, like it's sitting right in front of you, it'd be, what do you see there? Yeah, so it, it would be like, like as if you were over here, Okay. and that quarter cylinder is, just is that. So what you're seeing as you look at it is a rectangle, okay. two meters high and four meters wide. So the way to... I got it wrong because I thought projected mean basically just saying the area of that plane without it actually like projecting it in such a way that you actually see all of it. This area? No, the the, the surface area. Oh, the surface area. So yeah, yeah, and that is the that is the um, error that most people made. Yeah. Was uh, it's not that's and that's not a projection, right? So it's the it's the 
imagine you take this surface and you, um, as if you, uh, well, I, I'm not sure, I don't have other words to use other than project it onto a, yeah. a vertical plane. Well, the way to think about it, I think, is imagine you had a container that had a straight side here and just a curvy side over there. And you're wondering what the net hydrostatic force on the left wall and the right wall. Well, you know it must be the same because if it weren't, then this thing would roll right or left. So whatever is this shape, this curved shape that you just, what is its vertical extent and its in a horizontal extent, that's the area that you want. And you can you can uh, do problems where you say that we had not a curved surface, but just a something like that. We could analyze this, the force on this surface using the rules for a curved surface. And you, it would confirm that it's, it's not this area, but this area that is the, that gives you the mag, you know, this times that, that gives you the area, uh, gives you the area that you should use when calculating the magnitude of the force. Um, so they would also, I guess, be vertical and not be the same. In fact, the one on the left would be zero and the one on the right would be some sort of value. Right, right, right. So what you'd expect is that there's a, this is a plane surface, right? Now you could analyze that as uh, a horizontal component and a vertical component. This angle, let's just say this angle is 45 degrees, then you would expect the vertical force and the horizontal force to be the same. You can confirm that by working this particular problem and, and actually calculate, calculating what F sub H is the, and calculating what the vertical force is, where it's the vertical force is the weight of the water above. And I think I've done that. Um, I've had a test problems in the past where I asked you to calculate the magnitude of the horizontal force uh, on a plane surface. Right, do we have any that was the only problem of the, I, I don't think there was another problem on the test that was gotten wrong by a majority of people. It was just, just that. Number one. Well, that's because I think a lot of students oh, yeah. misread it. Right, 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 yeah. Number one, where you're asked to calculate the Number one, where you're asked to calculate that specific weight was missed by quite a number of people as well. All right, then. We had started on Friday talking about kinematics. There's a homework out there. We'll continue that now. Very quick summary of where we
where we were on Friday, we said that there's two types of flow in general. There are a lot of qualitative differences between the two. You can distinguish them by quantifying this number called the Reynolds number. One topic I'm going to hold off for next time on mass balances. Yep. They're in the notes, but we're going to I'm swapping the order of what you'll see in the notes to go to the last of the topics in the kinematics section. To talk about So, imagine we have this velocity vector that's actually can vary in four dimensions. Can vary in the three spatial dimensions and might be varying in time. There are That's a qualitative feature of the flow that's described at the start of the text. I think there's actually a homework problem. Maybe I wanted to use them. But um, there's some qualitative information on the different types of flow that I want you to read in the start of this chapter. I'd say that this is, um, if the flow really does, or the velocity factors really do vary in all three dimensions and time. We would call this three-dimensional unsteady flow, or unsteady, yeah. And by the fact that I've given it a little arrow over head, indicates that this is actually uh, something that might have three components to it. In the three spatial directions in X, Y, and Z. So you might have some movement of the water along the X axis, the Y axis, or the Z axis. usually refer to these as the general, they can vary in all three dimensions and in time. And in a problem like that, we might be interested in accelerations of the, the water as it moves.
say we want to find an acceleration vector, which might also have of the three x, y, and z directions. An example, an example of a problem where you might get this three-dimensional unsteady flow and velocity vectors that are also three-dimensional and unsteady. Say, um, imagine there's a box, a collection box that has a single outlet and multiple inlets. Inside this box, we'd expect all sorts of turbulent flow that might or might not be steady depending on whether these incoming flows themselves are steady or not. So we might have, we might even have one that's unsteady, that is it varies in time, and two others that are steady. What you expect is the inside here inside this box we have a 3D and we might want to calculate the acceleration vector at a particular point within this um, collection box. Okay, and we're going to do that by, in general, if we're, if we're given a specification of the, of the velocity vectors, we're going to uh, differentiate them to find these individual components of the of the acceleration vector. All right, so let's look at one individual term. This is the the um, x component of our acceleration vector. So that's just the, the scalar that's uh, associated with uh, acceleration in the x direction. of x isn't, doesn't have a direction, but it's um, the component of the acceleration that's in the x direction. All right. And if our velocity vector is three-dimensional and unsteady, our acceleration vector might also be three-dimensional and unsteady.
talked a little bit about this previously, that uh, acceleration of a, um, acceleration can have two parts. So what we're saying is that uh, is that what's referred to as the um, derivative of the velocity vector is the, is the acceleration vector and that's equal to Notation to do this. I'm just going to say yeah, I think I'm going to skip doing that because it, it's, uh, it's easier to do it uh, uh, term by term. So let's just look at the x component. given a velocity vector u specifying the velocity vector. It's got components u, v, and w. And so to get the x component of the acceleration, we take that x component of the velocity If I said that one of those four terms, one of those four terms is the local derivative. And you can think of that as if you stay stationary in space and look, how, look at how the velocity is varying, that would be the local derivative. Which one of those four terms would you say is the local derivative? du dt, correct. So this one is the local derivative x direction times the gradient of u in the x direction. And then the motion in the y direction, take that product with how u is varying in the y direction. So in each case you're looking at a, a gradient and a velocity. And they have to be, um, if you're going in the x direction, you take the velocity in the x direction. If you're, if you're looking at gradients in the y direction, you look at the velocity.
velocity in the y direction. We're looking at radiance in the z direction. We take the velocity in the z, and we, um, it's all three of those terms that collectively come together to make the convective acceleration for the x component. All right, now I'm going to, with this as the model, I'm going to get you to help me write the next of these three terms, the a sub y. So think about that while I write this down. Just like the velocity vector is three-dimensional, the, uh, the acceleration can also be three-dimensional. And A sub y, that's what we want to calculate next using that as our model. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to one of the terms? So now we're interested in uh, the, v vec the V part of the velocity specification. That's the motion in the Y direction. So instead of U, D, 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 X plus U, D, 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 Y. Okay, well, I think you're on to something there, but let's just do it turn by turn. So. Uh, so just give me one there um, for the U times dv by dx. U times dv dx. Right, and that's correct, right? See, so that's, we're interested in how the, the y component of the velocity is varying in the x direction as we take the product of that with the motion in the, you said u, correct? Correct. Okay. okay. And then, how about um, the local derivative, or the local acceleration, what would that be? DVDT. DVDT, it is, yeah. And then the other two of the convective accelerations are going to look like the A sub X, except now we substitute instead of U here we substitute V. Okay, so it's V, 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 Y, and W, D, 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 C. And that's A sub Y. That's the, the scalar that defines the portion of the acceleration vector that's in the y direction. And then finally, the, say this is most useful, this whole conversation that we're having here in how to define these acceleration vectors. This is not a topic that has a lot of practical applications unless you go on to other classes. So we, when I took um, turbulent flow and transport or a hydrodynamics or a higher level courses, uh, there was lots of use of these vectors, 
in the pipe flow process actually using this information. But it's good background if you if you plan to go on and study more in um, fluid mechanics. All right, and so from here, that's all we really need in the way of uh, information on acceleration vectors. From now, we can just uh, try out what we've learned on a problem or two. So what did yeah, put up? Uh, what is the fourth term after one, two, three? Yes, so this is uh, x, y, z, and time. Oh. All right, so there's first just this qualitative description of uh, this particular flow. What do we think? Steady or unsteady? Well, we do see that this that specifies the magnitude of the velocity in the x direction, it has a t in it, right? So as time varies, the u is going to vary, right? And as is the v, as the so. What we're saying is, is as t varies, these things vary. Is that steady or unsteady? Unsteady, correct. So it is unsteady. And what we see that there is, there might be, let's see, there is a time when the velocities are all zero, right? There is a at t equals minus 1, which I'm not sure how you define negative times, but if you could, uh, maybe that's the case, is that, that if t's are greater than 0, then there isn't a time where all the velocities are 0, and that they are generally increasing in time. So we might expect there to be an, uh, I guess, acceleration vectors just in general, does this look like a case 
where we're going to have a, a local a local acceleration. Yes, so that's a yes no. And remember what we de defined as the local acceleration term was you look at the individual velocity components and then see if there's any derivative with respect to time. And, and I see somebody nodding that yes, there is, right? So we're thinking local acceleration, yes. But to have a convective acceleration, what we said is that uh, this is just the x component, but the others look similar there have to be gradients in, in space of those uh, u, v, and w. If you look at these functions that define the u, v, and w components, do they vary depending on what the x, y, and z? No, no, they don't. So they are the same, this is a velocity field that's the same everywhere but increasing as time goes on. Okay, so convective acceleration, we think no to that. All right, and then just to answer The other quantitative questions we want uh, U at three, two, four, two. And actually it now that we've said that there's no convective acceleration because there are no gradients in the, any of the velocity components with any of the x, y, and z. So these could, these could be anything, right? They, it's only the time that matters. So we'll, we're going to have u is uh, Six. And V is right, it's two plus one is three times per time for the for the specification of those X, Y, and Z components. That, that's a simple example. Let me see if I have one that's slightly more complicated. Okay, well, this is the next one I have here. Any questions on this one before we move on? All right. Do you want slightly more complicated?
All right. So this is this is what we're going to find here. Some of it's qualitative. Some of it's quantitative. Is it one, two, or three dimensional? Well, it has a, remember the way that you decide that is how many, does it, which of the three possible directions of flow does it have? That's the, so this has flow in the x direction, it has flow in the y direction, and I, I suppose what it should say, because it is that word, saying that it doesn't have, oh, sorry, not, Z, but um, W, it has no velocities in the Z direction. So that, I think, gives it a way to say that this is 2D flow. Steady or unsteady? Unsteady, unsteady because we see there's a the T in our function for U and V that tells us that as we change the time, we're going to change the magnitude of U and V, so it's unsteady. And then as we look at the two components of velocity and looking at what would happen when we differentiate with respect to time for this thing, we'd say that it's going to have a non-zero so that tells us that the local acceleration, yes, it has some of that. And if we look at taking the U and the V and, and uh, doing partial differentials with respect to X and Y, uh, X and Y, X and Y, we see both of those would also have some non-zero parts, so we also expect a convective acceleration. All right, so um, on to the quantitative part of it. We also want it at x2, y3, and t4. So we get A sub x, we have to uh, just write it out here, the u dx, I'm sorry, the u dt, oh, 
Okay, and now we have to do our partial differentiation where if we partially differentiate with respect to time, we're holding the other, the x and the y constant. So we would think of the x and the y as just um, constants. And so um, the, this is a constant, doesn't change in time, so its derivative with respect to time is zero. Likewise for this, uh, and the only thing that's going to have a du dt term to it is uh, this part. So we have a, a 6t and then do the, the u. do the same thing for the second term. There's the D. And now we differentiate the u with respect to y. Alright, so again, well, it's just the same thing. It's, um, you know, this is like a, a constant out in front of the y. So it's, um, it's just x. That zero, that zero, and this is just x. So just like Yeah. Right, this was the constant, and then x here goes. All right, and then what we do is just plug in the values for So then we, yeah, um, yes, yes. I didn't put that in here. So we'll just do that one. It's uh, tedious, but. It's not any different uh, when you do the a sub y. So we get um, a sub x equals 6 times 4 plus 2 plus 
plus, let's see, this is uh, 16, that's 48, and 6 is 54, and 2 is 56. Please um, check my work here. That's um, 9, 18, 36, and 4 is 40. And we get, start with this one, that's um, 168 plus 80, that's uh, 248 plus 24 is 272, okay? solution here. Did you get it right? Yes. You did. Okay. And then again, to use the generic units, it would be a length per time square to specify an acceleration. And you can see where that comes from. Let's see. Can we... Well, you can... You can work out the terms in the acceleration uh, components to see that with U's given in terms of um, a length for time, both the convective acceleration, say a du, du, dx, that will have uh, dimensions of length for time squared, as will the local acceleration the UDT, which is length for time to time. All right, and that's where we're going to stop. Questions? There's, I believe, at least one homework problem. We need to um, some experience doing this sort of partial differentiation to find acceleration uh, components to define the acceleration factor. All right.